Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Chris Majeski. I'm the family pastor here at ACC. So glad that you chose to join us for worship. Uh, here at ACC, we believe that uh, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, that you can experience new life in Jesus Christ. And so our hope is by engaging in the service this morning, uh, that you will experience Christ and that you will grow closer to God. Uh, we're going to sing some songs of worship. We're going to hear from the Word of God. Uh, we're actually even going to experience communion together this morning. Uh, and so uh, if you're watching from home, just a heads up, you'll have a moment later on in the service to gather uh, your communion elements, but you'll need to provide them for yourself. A couple announcements as we get started with our worship service. The first is uh, I encourage you to fill out that communication card as we do each week. Uh, somewhere on your screen is a link for that communication card. And so uh, please take a moment to fill that out. There's a great way there just to communicate prayer requests, and we'd love that opportunity to pray for you and your family in the coming week. So uh, you can uh, uh, click on that link, uh, fill out that communication card. Uh, and then also uh, in there, you'll see if you're new with us, there's a box to check that says, I'm new. Uh, and that, that just gives us a way to follow up with you and help you uh, uh, learn more about our church and get connected to our community. We'd love to connect with you in that way. Uh, and then also on that communication card, you'll see if you're not already receiving our children's ministry resources, I send those out every Friday. If you're not already receiving those, you can click a, uh, click a box there and we'll get those sent out to you as well. Uh, announcement I want to make you aware of is that we've got a, a, a community paint-a-thon coming up uh, Saturday, September 19th. Uh, and so we do this each year. Uh, we participate in our local community in doing this. Uh, just a great way to love our neighbors, um, show the love of Jesus to, to, to our neighborhood, and so uh, help people in need. And so uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, you don't need to have any experience, and we'll actually feed you when you participate in this. So you get to you know, volunteer some time, but you get a meal out of it too. That's pretty nice. Um, and so uh, you can click on uh, the, our events section of our webpage. Uh, click on that, and you'll find some more information about it. Um, just a heads up, the deadline to register for that is September 1st. All right, so that's coming up. Um, but we'd love to have you join us for the Paint-a-Thon Saturday, September 19th. Today, we are continuing our sermon series in the Psalms of Ascent. We're looking at Psalm 133 today. I want to give you a sneak peek of the first verse. It says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. How much more wonderful it is when we worship in harmony, or some other translations say in unity. So regardless of the time or the place that you're joining us, know that a community of believers are celebrating Jesus by singing these songs of worship together. So this morning, my friends Joe and Kelia are going to be leading us in worship. And I invite you to join us in praising God in, in unity and harmony now. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here at Arlington Countryside Church, and it's my joy and my privilege to teach the Word of God uh, to you now. Um, it's really about the most favorite part of my job. I love being able to study God's Word and then help others to uh, understand it and apply it to their lives. And so I'm glad to be together in this way at this time. Today we're concluding our teaching series called Road Trip Playlist. It's a study of the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, Psalms 120 through 134 were songs that were to be sung by faithful Hebrews as they were on the road traveling to Jerusalem. A faithful Hebrew would make that trek at least three times a year. And so these psalms were designed for songs they could sing on the road. Um, these songs were important because what they did, they prepared the pilgrim's heart for worship once they arrived in Jerusalem. And it, it helped them uh, have a sense of who they are and a reminder of who God is. And it helped get them focused, helped get them centered, and it gave them encouragement for the arduous journey. And heading to Jerusalem, uh, that was the highest point in the area. And so any traveler heading towards Jerusalem is going uphill. They're ascending, thus psalms or songs of ascent. Well, you and I, we're on a journey towards God, and these psalms are rich with lessons for us as we make progress on our spiritual journey. And so in this final sermon in this series, um, I'd like to pray for us right now. Father God, we simply ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that you would give us hearts and minds that are open and receptive to your word, and we thank you that your word is reliable and trustworthy and our guide for all faith and conduct. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you now as we open your word. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let me set the scene for you, okay? Pretend like all of a sudden I always started wearing around a baseball uniform. And I was always carrying a baseball glove with me. And I was wearing spikes all the time. And I was confidently uh, telling everyone that I met that I am a baseball player. And then you were to turn around and ask me and say, oh, Dave, that's interesting. What team do you play for? Uh, who do you play? Well, where are your games at? Now, if I were to respond and say, oh, I don't have a team and, and I've never really played in a game before, Question, am I really a baseball player? Maybe, maybe not, right? But the one thing we do know for sure is that I'm doing it wrong. It doesn't make any sense to claim to be a baseball player, but you're not even on a team. In the same way, there are Christians, people who claim to be Christians, but you say, oh, really? That's great. Where do you go to the church? And they're like, oh, I don't do church, or I don't attend any church. And what can we surmise from that? Again, are they really a Christian? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But the one thing that we're sure of is that they're doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong because, you see, when God saves you, when God redeems you and makes you part of his family, he brings you into the church. It's the universal church, it's the spiritual church, it's the body of all believers around the world that you automatically become part of that. But there's also an element in which you're expected to become part of the visible church, a local body of believers that you're to hook up with. That's God's will because it's his will for us as Christians to be in a faith community. It's been said and it's true that the Christian life the Christian faith is personal, but it's not private. And you see, God created us to be in community, and specifically in regard to our faith development, it can't be done the way it needs to be done 
if we are isolated. And so the idea of a Lone Ranger Christian is truly an oxymoron. And so today's final Psalm of Ascent that we're looking at, Psalm 133, celebrates the community, the harmony that God wants us to experience and enjoy. And so we're in Psalm 133. Um, follow along as I read. Psalm 133, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem, a psalm of David. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. Okay, here's the first thing I want you to see is that David makes clear harmony is the best. David is a big fan of the harmony you can experience within a faith community. And he says, harmony is awesome. Again, look at the first verse. He starts out by proclaiming how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Now understand, David's not talking in a cerebral academic sense, like harmony is philosophically correct or it's morally wonderful. He's talking experientially and he's saying it's so enjoyable. It is so sweet to experience the harmony with other people of faith. Now, most likely when David was writing this, he was reflecting upon his being anointed as king, being coronated as king of Israel. Because David, in becoming king, drew together all 12 tribes from all over the land to come together to uh, serve him as king. And it brought great unity and harmony um, uh, to the country. And so he was probably thinking about that when he was saying how awesome harmony is. But you see, it's that harmony that the church is to be like a faith community, a body of believers that comes together and experiences harmony. And when you do, it is sweet. Have you ever experienced that kind of harmony, that kind of unity before? It's God's will, and it's why he created the church. I want to take you to uh, Ephes Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. It says, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by, by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. <coughs> Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. You see, in this day that this was written, the hostility between Jews and non-Jews, between Jews and Gentiles, was huge. Tremendous amount of racism, prejudice, uh, and mistreatment, and, and uh there was just a lot of hostility there. And when the church was created and men and women of all languages and all tribes and all people groups were brought together in Christ and brought into local churches together, it brought together Jews and Gentiles in the same local church. Well, with such a long history of not getting along, how is this going to work? And so the Apostle Paul explains uh, from a theological standpoint it's over. The fighting is over. That God loves everybody. That Jesus is bringing all people together in himself. And 
There's an interesting phrase here. It says that Jesus broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And that's kind of a double entendre. It, it's got kind of a double meaning because metaphorically it speaks of, of, of the wall of hatred and misunderstanding that he's torn down, but also in, in, in the temple. Uh, the temple was designed to where uh, Gentiles could only go so far. And then there was a wall where they could go no further and only Jews could go further deeper into the holy places of the temple. And so there was always this uh, distinguishing uh, mark between the Gentiles and the Jews was this wall. And, and so Paul is saying that Jesus tore down this wall. So all people are on equal footing now. All people are on level ground and everybody is the same. And so that wall that separates Jews and Gentiles is gone. And so it's an encouragement to us that when people come together in Jesus Christ, everyone is on equal footing, that all people are the same and that we're called to be a body. Now, here's what's important. This is an important note, and it's sometimes misunderstood, but it's the idea that uniformity, um, it's important to note that uniformity is not harmony. Uniformity is not harmony. That's two different things. You see, many people, and even churches, sometimes think that unity or harmony means be, being Johnny One Note, where you're going dink, 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 hitting middle C over and over again. And they expect everybody to be the same. Dress the same, vote the same, believe the same things on virtually everything, and just, you know, they're like cloning uh, people, and they, they, they expect this uniformity to take place. That's not harmony. That's not unity. Harmony isn't Johnny One Note, dink, 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 middle C over and over again, but it's making a chord. It, it's, it's taking diverse notes, like a, like a F, C, and E, e and pressing them down at the same time, and you've got a C chord. And it sounds beautiful, but it's three different notes playing at the same time. And that's the beauty of diversity in the midst of unity that creates the harmony that we all desire. And so uniformity is not harmony. Uniformity is ultimately when humans try forcing the issue. When they, through their own effort, try creating unity, it more times than not just creates uniformity. The harmony we desire is wrapped around the truth of the gospel. Now, in this psalm, there's two descriptions that David gives of harmony in verse 2 and 3. And both of these examples or descriptions are pretty obscure to us but it's because we're not ancient Hebrews. If we were the original readers of this, we would connect with both these examples. But since we're a couple thousand years removed and we're in a different culture, we don't really know what he's talking about. But a little bit of digging can help us understand. So look at the first description he gives of what harmony is like. He says in verse 2, For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. In scriptures, oil is often a sign of God's presence, of God's blessing. It's often a symbol of his spirit, right? And so this particular oil is in reference to Aaron, who was Moses' brother, who was anointed as the first high priest of Israel. And so this wasn't just any oil oil. It was anointing oil, making Aaron the high priest. He would represent the nation to the great living God that they served. And so when David uses this as an example of what harmony is like, here's what he's saying. That harmony means we see others, and by others I mean other believers. We see others as a priest who can bless us and teach us. Now, think how revolutionary it is if we view those in our church, if we view fellow believers, not just another person, but we see them as a priest, as somebody who can minister to us, who can bless us, who can teach us. There's not a single person in your church you can't learn from. There's not a single person in your church that God can't use to bless you. 
And that's the church functioning as it should. And it would revolutionize our relationships and give us a taste of harmony. If we viewed others as priests, there'd be a sense of honor, there'd be a sense of respect, and there'd be a sense of anticipation that I can benefit from rubbing shoulders with this person. They can bless me, they can teach me something. God wants to use them in my life just as he would Aaron, the priest. So that's the first description. Now the second is in verse three. David goes on and says, harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. Well, Mount Hermon was the tallest or is the tallest mountain in Israel, as I understand it. It's about 9,100 feet. And at that high of an elevation, uh, the morning dew is extremely heavy. Now, we've all experienced that around here, right? That, you know, you, you walk in the grass first thing in the morning and you can get your shoes wet uh, because the dew's so heavy. Well, at that elevation, the dew is just soaking. And he says that harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon. And so it's the idea, dew pictures uh, the ideas of freshness, of blessing, of growth that that moisture will uh, bring. So, based on that, the reason why David uses this illustration is because harmony means we look for the best in others and anticipate growth. That being with others is refreshing and, and we expect good things. Harmony means we look for the best in others and anticipate growth. Now, if you've spent any time with other believers, right, you know for a fact that we are all a work in progress. Now, some of you might be thinking right now, Dave, I think you've got some room for improvement. I couldn't argue with you. You're absolutely right. But I would counter that statement by saying, you should have known me 20 years ago. Or you should have known me 40 years ago because, man, if you thought I had room for improvement now, you should have seen me 20 years ago, 40 years ago. The truth is I've changed. God's worked in my life. And whatever rough edges I still have, whatever inadequacies I still have, it's not nearly as bad as what it used to be. And I praise God that I'm not all that I should be, but I'm not what I used to be. And Christ has made all the difference. And so as a body of believers in a faith community, we've got to stop labeling people. We've got to stop selling people short. We've got to stop writing people off and just saying, oh, they're always going to be like that. And we have no uh, hope for them, no expectancy. We have to have relationships where we expect growth, change, freshness, and the best is yet to be in all of our relationships. None of us have peaked yet. None of us have reached our potential. None of us, none of us have hit the cap of what God wants to do in our life. And so harmony flourishes when we view each other with this type of expectancy. From the, directly from the psalm, there's one last um, observation I want to make, and it's this, that harmony is not something we achieve. It comes down to us from God. If we look back at verse 2 about the oil, it says that the oil was poured over Aaron's head, and it ran down his beard and down his robes. And then in verse 3 of the dew on Mount Hermon, it says that it falls on the mountains. And so in this psalm of ascent, descent is emphasized that, that the, the oil runs down, that the dew comes down, and it's a picture. And it was the point that Paul was making in Ephesians that harmony is a gift from heaven. It's a gift from God. That it's not something we uh, discover or, or manufacture on our own, but it comes down from heaven and that harmony blesses us as a gift from God. And it's a reminder to us, it's a New Testament truth, that we don't have to create harmony or unity. We are simply called upon to maintain it. God gives us that harmony as a gift. And so I want to spend the remainder of our time by thinking about four steps towards maintaining harmony, four mindsets, four things we can do uh, to 
better our church, to make ourselves a better Christian among our other fellow believers, right, in order to maintain harmony. So let me give you four suggestions. The first is this, promote truth. That a key part of true harmony is you have to cling to what is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. United in thought and purpose. Harmony, you see, needs to be based upon a common confession, a body of truth that brings us together. And that body of truth that brings us together are the Holy Scriptures, are the Bible. It's the good news that we believe together, the good news that comes from Jesus Christ. It's the basic basics of historical orthodox Christianity. And you think a great example would be the Apostles' Creed, that there's bottom line basic agreements we have regarding what is true and what constitutes orthodox faith. The Apostle John, when he was writing his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he made it crystal clear that our unity and love and fellowship as Christians is based upon a correct view of Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we never abandon truth for the sake of love, or we never abandon truth for a false unity or a false harmony. That's a keystone here is is promoting truth. It's objective truth, and we can be confident in it. And so maintaining harmony involves promoting truth and definitely not abandoning it in the name of harmony. Okay? Number two in maintaining harmony is we need to cultivate humility. We need to cultivate humility. And now this takes us back to a verse that we looked at two weeks ago. Uh, It might be vaguely familiar to you. Uh, But check out Romans 12, verse 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. So, we certainly shouldn't have an inflated view of ourselves, but we also shouldn't have a deflated, pessimistic view of ourselves, but we're to just have an honest, accurate view of ourselves. We're to see ourselves as God sees us. And so that gives us the confidence to believe you and I, we're not rivals. We have nothing to prove to each other, that we are free to serve each other, to give preferential treatment to each other. I don't need to push you down in order to elevate myself. I understand I am loved by God. I am inherently valued and worthy, but I'm called upon to serve those around me, and God's equipped me to do that. I heard a great little uh, story this past week about the famous American composer and um, conductor, Leonard Bernstein. And Leonard Bernstein was once asked, what's the hardest position to fill in an orchestra? And his answer was, second fiddle. Now think about that. Second chair in an orchestra requires great skill, but also a willingness to be relatively obscure. I think one of the greatest lies that our world tells us and that our own sin nature tells us is that uh, pleasure comes only in being first chair. And so everyone scrambles, everyone claws, and everyone's discontent until they get to that first chair. And what a tragedy that is. That that's not what's involved, that that, that God calls us to humbly let others be in front of us and to serve them in any way we can. And so we need to cultivate humility and have an accurate view of ourselves. Third idea in maintaining our harmony is don't be a dipstick. 
all right? Don't be a dipstick. Uh, back in the day, I used to play basketball at the local Y three or four mornings a week before uh, work, like 6 a.m., the ball, ball game would start. And it was pretty much the same group of guys. And, you know, now no one had perfect attendance and guys would filter in and out. But generally speaking, it was the same group of guys that would be there. And we'd have a great time. And everything would go well. We'd call our own fouls. And, you know, there was no arguments or fights except when this one guy would show up. And he would show up fairly regularly. Fortunately, he didn't come all the time. But whenever this guy, I won't use his name, I'll just call him Dipstick, okay? Whenever Dipstick showed up, we knew there was gonna be constant arguing, complaining, and even fighting because he was a pot stirrer. He was a pot stirrer. And he was always trying to inflict his will on everyone else. Even though he was all the way across the court, he was the perfect referee and could make all the calls, and, and he was just very annoying, and he was that guy. And what otherwise would be a peaceful, fun, friendly game, when he showed up, he brought out the worst in everybody, and he caused all kinds of arguments and dissent. Have you ever experienced a person like that? I'm sure you have. Maybe in your school, in your workplace, right? Maybe your neighborhood perhaps even in your own family, that person who's just that dipstick that's always stirring things up. I'm gonna encourage you, don't be that dipstick, all right? Don't be that guy. Oftentimes, all we have to do to maintain peace and unity is just don't be that kind of person that's gonna cause trouble. Uh, it's actually a very scriptural concept. Proverbs 26, verse 20 says, fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear when gossip stops. That's great stuff, right? So don't give disharmony or disunity any fuel. It's that simple. Lastly, in maintaining harmony, let me suggest the scripture teaches that we need to lead with love. We need to lead with love. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul was giving a list of character qualities for a person who's committed to Jesus Christ. And um, as he's concluding this list uh, and the difference that Jesus should make in our life, he concludes with this in Colossians 3 verse 14. He says, above all, of all these qualities I've already talked about and listed, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So see, love is always the default answer, right? That when we're not sure how to react in a situation, when we're not sure what we should do, let your default be love. That's what we're called to do. Love always has the best interests of others in mind. Let me say something parenthetically here. Because love always has the other person's best interests in mind, there will be occasions where love will wound you. That sometimes love involves saying hard things to people and not letting things just go by, right? And I want to uh, tell you that just a couple of days ago, um, I was having a conversation with my wife. We were standing in the kitchen, and she said, hey, Dave, can I give you the last 10%? Can I say the last 10% of what I was thinking? And I was like, oh, you know, okay. You know, I, I was afraid something was coming. And then my loving wife gave me a gentle rebuke. And I had to initially fight some defensiveness, right? And some rationalizing why what she said isn't really very accurate. But as soon as she said it, I knew she was right. And the truth was, I was being pretty selfish. The truth was, I was being pretty short-sighted. And my wife loves me. I know she does. But she loves me enough to gently say, hey, you're getting off course here, right? You're not thinking straight and challenging me in that way. And so love isn't always just patting people on the back. Love isn't always agreeing with people. Love sometimes will say, hey, you're veering off course, you know, and you need to come back. Well, my friends, the capability for us to experience harmony and to love others the way we should comes when we know and accept the love God has for us. I want to Close with this verse, 
Romans 5, verse 8. It says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. I love the truth in Romans 5, 8, that God loves us even when we were unlovable, even when we had all kinds of rebellion in our life and wrong thinking in our life and broken relationships in our life. He still loves us. And it's a great assurance to you and I that we don't have to clean ourselves up before we come to God, that God loves us just as we are. And when we come to him, he helps us get our act together. We don't have to get our act together before we come to him. We come to him broken. We come to him muddy and bloody and dirty and sweaty and messed up. And God loves us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so all the bad decisions you and I make, all the mistakes we made, Christ died in our place. When he died on the cross, he died as our substitute. And that tremendous sacrifice that God the Father sent his only son shows, exhibits how much God loves us and God calls us to come to him to receive healing and wholeness and forgiveness and to receive the gift of eternal life. I want to encourage you that if you've never responded to the good news of Jesus Christ, if there's never been a point in your life where you've placed your trust in Jesus, believing he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead to give you new life, that maybe even now you would choose to give your life to Christ. God loves you and God wants you to experience the harmony and the beauty of relationships within a faith community. So now that faith community by and large is virtual, it's not ideal, but you know what? It works, especially if we fully engage. And the day will come when we're back together. But folks, you'll never experience that harmony. You'll never experience the benefits of a faith community if you haven't first responded to the love of God that's found in Jesus Christ. I trust that you'll do that. And if you have any questions about what I'm talking about right here at the end of this sermon, I would encourage you to email me at dave at acchurch.com. Dot org, and I'd love to interact with you and tell you more if you have any questions, okay? Thanks a lot. All right, hey, I'm back real quick. Soon as my sermon ended, Adam, who's recording me, our worship pastor, said, hey, musicians are going to be upset with you because you got what a C chord is. You got it wrong. I said it was F, C, E. Forgive me. I didn't have a keyboard in front of me. A C chord is actually G, C. E. Right, Adam? I apologize to you musical people. I didn't mean to offend you. See, I'm still a work in progress, right? All right, thanks. Well, at this time, we're going to prepare ourselves to take communion. Uh, and so uh, I'd encourage you right now, uh, we're going to give you two minutes to gather your elements. You'll need uh, some kind of bread element, a uh, piece of bread or cracker or pita, something like that. Um, and then you'll need uh, a juice component. So you can use wine or, or juice, uh, um, any kind of thing that can symbolize the blood of Christ. So I'll give you two minutes to go ahead and gather your communion elements now.
for us during his ministry. It reminds us of his death on our behalf. And we have these elements. We have the bread symbolizing his body, which was given for us. And we have the juice, which symbolizes his blood, which was shed for us. So this is a practice for those who've crossed the line of faith. So if you haven't crossed the line of faith, I'd encourage you just to observe and not partake of the elements. And I say that because the scriptures are clear that this is really just for those who have already placed their trust in Jesus and are currently living for him. So if that's not you, if you haven't done that, cross the line of faith, then I'd encourage you to use this time to reflect on your spiritual journey. Where are you at and what's keeping you from crossing the line of faith? And perhaps there's a conversation that you can have with one of us pastors here. We'd love to help you with that and talk with you through that. So this act of communion, this act of, of worship unites us as Christ followers. We may be separated by denominational differences, but we are unified at the altar. We are unified in our dependence upon Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And right now, as we are scattered pray that this moment will speak to your heart, that you know that you are not alone, that you are part of God's family and that you're part of the ACC family, and that this time of, of separation is really only temporary. So let it remind you that God is still on the throne, that he is at work redeeming our world and shepherding our souls. And so I pray this time is an encouragement to you. So in order to prepare our hearts for communion, what I'd like to do is to invite you to spend some time in confession. And when I, I say that word confession, I wanna make clear what, what I'm talking about there. Really, when I think of confession, I think of two things. I think of one, of, of shining a light on our sin, of exposing it before God, um, not hiding it or covering it up, not making it small or insignificant, but actually just acknowledging it before Him, openly and honestly. And the second thing I think about is, is agreeing with God about our sin. We don't call them mistakes or, you know, just things that we shouldn't have done. We recognize them as sin, as inappropriate behavior. We call sin, sin. And so uh, confession, I think, is so important for us in this because we are remembering that Jesus died on the cross for us, that he paid the price for our sin, that there was a need that we had, and he fulfilled that. And so as we take time to look inward and reflect on our own sin and confess, we honor his sacrifice. We honor the, the, the contribution he made, the full contribution he made to our forgiveness. We couldn't do it ourselves, he did it for us. And so I hope that you see confession as a freeing thing, not as beating up, beating yourself up kind of thing. Uh, it's not about how bad we are, it's about being honest and vulnerable with God, about being open and, and transparent with Him. And when we do that, it actually opens us up to receive His grace because He welcomes us with open arms and loves us unconditionally. So I'd like to invite you to spend two minutes just spending time reflecting on your life and confessing your sin before God. Just you and God, spend some time with Him now.
I'd like to share two scriptures with you now. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Praise God for what Jesus has done for us. And so let's go ahead and now and celebrate the Lord's Supper together and remember what Jesus has done for us. So would you bow with me now as I give thanks for the bread, the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to earth to be born as a man, to suffer and to die for our sins. Thank you for accepting his sacrifice as payment for our sins and for allowing us to have a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for obeying your Father's will and dying on the cross. As we remember your sacrifice and your body that was given for us, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 24, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And let's pray once again and give thanks for the cup. Jesus, we thank you for the blood you shed for us on the cross. You were the pure and spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice, whose innocent blood has set us free and saved us from our sin. Thank you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves and for showing us mercy when we deserved punishment. We praise you for rescuing us from darkness and setting us free. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. In the, same way, he, in the same way, he took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink the cup together. Well, as we continue on with our worship, I pray that your heart is encouraged and that you sense God's goodness and faithfulness to you. We're now going to sing a beautiful song that reminds us of the powerful truths that we've just celebrated, that Jesus has secured our forgiveness, and that God welcomes us with arms wide open.
Well, we've worshiped through song and through the hearing of God's word, and we're going to continue worshiping now uh, as we uh, receive our offering. And so uh, there's a link on your screen for you to give, or you can go online at acchurch.org slash give. Uh, but I'd like to go ahead now and pray for our offering. So would you bow in prayer with me? Father, we thank you uh, for the ministry uh, that you are doing in and through ACC. Uh, Lord, the great work that you're doing in our church family and in our community and around the world. Uh, we're grateful for the gifts that you've given us, and we give back to you now a portion of what you've given us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless these gifts, that you would use them to continue the great work you're doing at helping people experience new life in Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now receive the benediction from Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve him.